in today's episode of the KC Sports Authority podcast. It is bye week for the Kansas Jayhawks, and we want to take a few minutes here to reflect on the season so far, catch everybody up on how the season's going, and then maybe talk a little bit about how we hope to see this team head down the stretch coming out of the bye week. It was good, y'all. It's your boy JD6 here with my man. Shout out to KC Sports Authority. Make sure y'all go check that podcast out, man. You heard the man. All right, and welcome in to the KC Sports Authority podcast. I am your host, Keegan Russell. With me tonight, we got the boys, JB Merker and Christopher Tenpenny. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing today? Oh, man. I'm doing all right. Uh, a little a little upset still over the Oklahoma State game, which we'll probably get into. But, um, man, you know what? I keep reminding myself at the beginning of the season, if I would have seen that graphic, 5-2 and two at the bye week, I would have been pretty darn happy. So trying to remain positive. Exactly. I'm the same way. Just like remembering the previous 10 years and the outlook we've been these last two years, just be like, okay, 5-2 and two, I would have killed for two and a half seasons, two years ago. So, like. Just relax. It was, an, it was an ugly game. It was a bad loss. Something Jayhawks should have won, but like record still looks all right. It's funny how quickly per, um, expectations can change when we're used to losing for the last 10 years. <laughs> uh, but before we get into it, like I said, it is the bye week. Uh, remember, you can find the podcast over on Spotify and on YouTube. Make sure you're hitting that subscribe button. You can also hit us up on any of our social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, at KCSA Pod. And of course, Christopher, you guys recognize his face from over on the Aftermath podcast doing some of the Chief stuff we've been got going on. Right now, you can go back and watch the, the post-game recap of the beatdown of the Broncos. I guess it wasn't beatdown offensively. But still a beat down of the Broncos who have not won in the Mahomes era yet. Um, and then I know they'll have a preview coming up later for the other division game with the Chargers this weekend and some of the stuff going on there. But, fellas, it is the bye week for K football, and this is a different type of bye week. Um, this is the first time in quite a while that we're heading into a bye week sitting with a winning record, 5-2. and two. Now, of course, we've stumbled in a couple of games here that we're going to talk about. Lots of headlines, injury concerns, play calling, all sorts of things to get into. But let's start with that Oklahoma State game this past weekend. You know, KU should have won that game. And, of course, they ended up losing to Oklahoma State. Um, where do you guys want to start with this? I got a lot of thoughts about the fourth quarter. I'm sure you guys do, too. Uh, who wants to get us going first on that game? Uh, I'll start us off here. I just think... Man, I, I'm kind of glad we're recording this now and not the night of right the after game. the game. <laughs> I texted Keegan for anyone that uh, is just listening to this and hasn't heard. I texted Keegan and I was like, "Do you want to record tonight? Because I have some choice words." Um, I, <laughs> I was pretty upset. I think there's a lot of things to be upset about with that game. I mean, the play calling, yeah, and, and it was. It was uh, on KU Twitter when you're looking through there and uh, a lot of criticism, a lot of criticism of Jason Bean. Dude, Jason Bean is not the reason we lost that game. He's not. He, he, I don't care about the interceptions. I don't care. Obviously, those were tough to deal with, but we had our chances. I personally feel, and I'd hate to just say it, but I'm going to say it, I personally feel it was the refs and it was the coaches and it was the coaches, uh, you know, with play calling, things of that nature, especially in the fourth quarter that lost us the game. It does kind of feel like every time we talk about a KU loss, especially basketball too, as a KU fan, it is natural tendency to bring up the refs. <laughs> Not that the refs cost us the game, but they definitely influence parts of the game. And that, that's always one thing you want to make sure – you know, we talked about that with the Chiefs as well, especially with right now the NFL. Everybody's like, oh, the Chiefs get all the calls. The hope is that the referees do not impact the game. And say what you guys want about the rest of the game, that that offsides call that was missed could have been a major turning point, not only for that drive, but how the rest of the game ended up. So, you know, may, maybe yeah. there's a little bit of truth to that. But, of course, you know, KU had plenty of other opportunities throughout that game, shot themselves in the foot late. 
Um, Jason being, you know, does what he, he does and makes poor decisions despite now, again, he had a really good game. I was, I was sitting there looking at the box score at one point going, wow, he's got five touchdowns and 300 plus passing yards. Is this Jason Bean on the field? You know, I know a lot of that was, he was taking what the defense was giving him and that was good play calling. Um, but I think again, you see the difference between Jason Bean and Jalen Daniels in this game where. Jason has a few select plays that he just doesn't make the right read and shows that, you know, he's just not quite to that level of Jalen. But Chris, what did you think about the game and how it, how it ended? I thought before we even get to the ending, I thought the decision to go for two, the next four straight times is what I thought the turning point was. That was, that was pissing me off in the moment. Like clearly had another kicker that can make extra points. Why are we giving away points here with Jason? Again, your backup quarterback. I don't care how he's played. We've kind of seen Jason being in these two point conversions and yet what it was it three or four, something like that conversions. They failed on all of them. Like how big would it, those four points have been down the stretch? They would have been huge. So that yeah, was cause those my... four points. Then you're playing for a field goal the last 20 seconds. Yeah. They, were, they were starting to move down the field. Those last couple. Of plays. Exactly. So that's where, that's where my frustration started. And then, you know, the Jason Bean turns back into Jason Bean, the, the missed by the call, the missed call by the refs. Like some of that, was they already shot themselves in the foot before we even got to there with those decisions? So that's where my frustration started, and uh, yeah, it was just a, it was a game that they definitely should have won. So Chris, you saw you saw the offsides that should yeah. have been called, right? Yeah, right. Are we are we you are we dumb for saying that was an obli- like obvious like clear as day offsides, or or in your opinion, do you see an argument there against it? I don't think it was clear as day. Like, I mean, obviously you slow anything down and you can see it, but it wasn't like he was, it was like, you know, it was half his body. If even that was over. Now I don't even know if that much of his body was over. So it was pretty close. I can see on the moment, especially, um, you know, when refs are kind of used to the right and left tackle moving a little early that like, just, you know, without even realizing, just kind of blinking or something, you missed that, that like I, it should have been called. Yes. But was it as egregious to where it's like inexcusable? I don't think it was on that level. Well, you know, it was what happened was it would have given us the first down. Right. We, Big you goal. know, we would have gotten that drive. We would have kept it alive. Um, instead, it's a big turnover. We played it out because we expected the call. And we kind of played that that as if we were expecting the call. We played mm-hmm. that that play so poorly. And I'm not even mad about how poorly it was because I was waiting for the flag. I'm right. sitting there waiting for the flag. And then it ends up being a turnover on downs and Oklahoma state's at the 50 yard line gets a touchdown on their drive, um, gets the lead. Like, it's like, dude, I, I just, that was very frustrating. Um, I think I, I, we've talked about it probably on chiefs episodes too, where if we have a, a situation where it's like fourth and inches or fourth and one fourth and less than one, why aren't we doing a quarterback sneak? I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, don't we get talked me started about that. on that. <laughs> God, hey, there's I, nothing like actually, short yardage situations and watching teams spread the ball all the way out from sideline to sideline and have to get five yards to get one yard. And let's get into that that fourth that fourth down call. You know, not only does KU burn the timeout when they probably could have saved it and used it for their next defensive possession when they really needed it. They come out with one yard. Now, granted, the run game was not super effective. Oklahoma State did a fairly decent job. I know some of those were, again, poor reads. Um, Highshaw didn't really get going that much outside of his one longer run. Same thing with Neil. You know, a third of his yards came on one carry. Uh, So they held the offensive line back pretty well and kept that run game in check. But we're talking about one yard. And the best play we could come up with coming out of a timeout on fourth and one was running – uh, being to his non-dominant side of the field off of a pass rush to Jared Casey in the flat who had a guy all over him. So even if he had caught the ball and it was a good throw, he's like four yards behind the line of scrimmage. Like wh- why why even put us in that situation when you have Devin Neal, you have Daniel Highshaw? Heck, put Casey in the backfield as the fullback and just turn around and give it to Highshaw and let those thighs push him forward. That to me was, I mean, there's a lot of frustrating play calls in the game, but not being able to figure out how to get one yard with the creative mindset that Kotal Nikki has. And instead we go to uh, run it out to the left, to the flat behind the line of scrimmage to turn it over. Yeah. yeah. I talked about that a couple times. I think 
Um, there might have been a, a podcast we recorded not long ago where I was saying, Jason Bean just – I want him to say no. I want him to say no to the coaching staff. Uh, just, I, I mean, I know it's this, it's this crazy sin to. It doesn't happen in college football, coaches, right? <laughs> I'm like, just say no. Just, I don't know. I mean, it, it's tough. I, I think he. I again, I'm not saying that it's his fault. I think he had a great game overall, overall. And man, I was, I was saying in my little notes that I was taking throughout the, uh, throughout watching the game, I thought a couple of his passes, uh, namely, I think it was one of the, I think it was either one or both of the Mason Fairchild touchdowns, best passes I probably ever saw from him ever. And um, man, it's just, it's, it's tough to lose a game like that, but you win some, you lose some, but man, that one, that one should have been ours. Yeah, I think the coaching staff forgot who was quarterback just because of the way he played for three quarters. Like, and I mean, I I guess like, I don't blame him for that because he's playing was playing phenomenal. But what is this obsession? Like, not just with Leipold, but like coaches calling rollouts with one option plays on do or die. Like you see it in the NFL, you see it in college. Like, why are we giving backup quarterback one option on, on fourth and short? Like. Why? Why is that the play call? I like if they would have just dropped him back to pass and he had to go through reads, that would have been much better than hey yeah. Casey, I'm circling you. If you're not open, we're screwed. And that's essentially what they did with their backup quarterback and their backup yeah. tight end. And it's like he he didn't even have the opportunity to run for the down if right. he needed to. There was just all right, one read the whole way. The defense read it right away too. A guy came out. I mean, again, our defensive line struggled at, or offensive line struggled. They got four sacks and a lot of pressure. Um, but yeah, it's just that that was frustrating seeing that roll out. I'm like, this is this is the play you draw up of you know, Andy Kotelnicki has been known to be the mad scientist of sorts when it comes to play calling, and that's the best he could come up with. Like, even a reverse, a you know. The, the tight end under center that everybody hates, you know, even something, you know, obviously we all know the Philadelphia Eagles are the only team that can successfully run the tush push. Everyone between <laughs> the NFL and college football the last few weeks has proven that to be the case, but there's gotta be something more than let's scramble out for 10 yards to throw the ball four yards behind the line of scrimmage when we need three feet. Um, so yeah, very frustrating. So unfortunately KU dropped that game where they should have won, should have been the favorite, should have clinched bowl eligibility right there. Now we're sitting here on the bye week, still five and two. So all things considered, we're still probably above where we would have guessed we'd be. You know, JB, I was thinking about this back to our, our season preview. And I was looking at KU's record here. And, you know, I know we went back and forth on, you know, could they be seven, eight, nine win team? And I think at this point in the season, we were kind of expecting the Texas loss. So we were pretty good with four and two or five and one. Um, so with that being said, you know, does that mean we're we're right on par with preseason expectations? You know, did those expectations change because we started off so hot? Uh, what just what's the mindset you guys have coming into the bye week of where we started the season to where we are now? Yeah, I don't know about you, Chris, but I thought I thought where we're at with five and two is right where we kind of thought we would be, not only for the optimistic KU fans, but for the realistic KU fans. Um, I didn't necessarily think it would be Texas and Oklahoma State. I probably thought it would have been Texas and like a weird loss to Illinois or Texas and anybody else almost. Um, I, I didn't really see Oklahoma State being one of them. I, th I thought we've been playing them really well, at least last year. Uh, their team is not as good as it was uh, in recent years. So for me, the losses just haven't been exactly where I was expecting, but Got to love the record. Yeah, I think I was going in thinking four and three probably because I didn't know – like Illinois, I thought it was going to be a little better than what they were. And then just seeing we were going to Okie State, like even if Okie State was a little down, you know, I still was like I wouldn't be surprised if that was a loss. Now as the season played out and you saw what KU was playing and said Okie State, that, that changed very quickly to where I thought that should be a win. But going into the season, it was kind of one that didn't feel great, great about. But yeah, five and two. You can't you can't be too upset about it. Obviously, you would love to be six and one, and really like with the bye and Jalen getting healthy, like that Oklahoma games becomes really exciting. 
kind of robbed that a little bit now because of the Okie State loss. But still, they, they've got they've got some games outside of Oklahoma. They've got four games that they could win and four games that they could lose, um, kind of depending on health and whatnot. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I like I know that's obviously you win or lose. Like I get that's kind of funny way to say, it, but you know, like yeah. fairly close, evenly matched teams in one way or the other. So it'll be exciting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I think as a fan base, if we would go back to the beginning of the season and say, hey, at the bye week, we're going to be 5-2 and two heading into a big-time matchup against Oklahoma, every single one of us would take that and we'd be happy about it. I think the two reasons why you hear a lot of frustration coming into this bye week, um, one, the two games we've lost, we were very much in and could have won. Now, I know Texas got out of hand in the fourth quarter, but going into the fourth quarter, that game was very much within reach. And then the Oklahoma State game is a team we should have beat and are better than and just made mistakes and issues down the stretch. So I think that's where some of the frustration comes into play is the fact that, you know, last two, three years ago, we're, we're sitting here going, well, at least they put up a good quarter. You know, at least they showed a little bit of promise. Now it's like you – I think it's frustrating because they were in the game. They had opportunities to win. They're expected to be the favorite in most games now. It's a weird dynamic shift for KU fans. But I think that's half of it. I think the other half is the the frustration of the Jalen Daniels situation pouring into the rest of the season. This is now a second year in a row um, where we're dealing with an injury from Jalen, really the third year in a row of our starting quarterback heading into the season, having injury concerns. Um, And I think that's kind of spilling over too, because again, we could sit here and say, if we had Jalen for that Texas game, who knows, maybe we come out on top. If you had Jalen Oklahoma State game, feel pretty good about that. Um, so I think that's where their frustration lies with fans. So to me, that also is a good reason why the bye week couldn't come at a better time. Uh, we've had a solid start to the year. We've got a couple injuries here and there. Times, you know, guys get dinged up all the time this this part of the year. So the bye week is much needed. Um, the Jalen Daniels question is going to be. Day by day, I think I was talking with a couple a couple of people today about it too, and what's the just the the general census I get from the frustration of people is there's just no information, nothing. Ku is quiet, Jalen's camp is quiet. There's just nothing out there on how serious of this this injury is. There's just nothing for us to go off of other than we're taking a day. It kind of reminds me to that that Eric Berry situation several years back of, oh he's he's day to day. Okay, well, he was day to day for 25 weeks of the year. So, is he playing or is he not playing? So, just what what is your guys' thoughts on the situation? You know, I'm not really big into the conspiracies that are going around. I don't think the the Michigan State stuff is serious. I don't think really any of the transfer stuff is serious. There's nothing to me that indicates Jalen has a desire to transfer or needs to transfer, um, especially when we're sitting here five and two still potentially in a big 12 race. So just what's the thoughts with you guys on, on the Jalen Daniels situation? Go ahead, Chris. I, it's just tough. Cause like there definitely are some doubts and questions going into my mind. Like I don't want to talk bad about the best player that this f- team has had in for since Todd Reesing, you know, and like, and those, those teams. So, but it does make you question his toughness a little bit, just especially because of how hush hush it is about everything. Like, you know, the, with the going last year, going to this year, like, is he really just that frail or is it one of those things to where it's like he's just kind of banged up and doesn't really want to power through? Like, I, I don't know. And I hate that I'm talking about this guy this way, but like, those are the kind of questions I start to think about when you don't have the information and it's a continued thing that we've seen for multiple seasons now. For me, it makes me more curious about his future overall because, you know, I'm looking at this upcoming Oklahoma game. And I'm thinking, okay, like this is a chance for him to come back and it's going to be after a bye week. Um, But do we want to chance him re-aggravating his injury against a very good Oklahoma team um, that we're probably going to lose to anyway? Sorry, spoiler alert. We're probably going to lose that game. (laughs) Um, At least it's a home (laughs) game. We're undefeated at home. Defense plays really well at home too. It is. And there have been a couple times in recent years when we've – really giving Oklahoma a run for their money. I remember what when was it? It was a couple of years back. Like we were really, really close to beating Oklahoma at home. And there a was like a ridiculous out. Caleb Williams sack turned <laughs> into first down where Rich Miller had him, smacked him. And then next thing he knows, he's like, 
and Caleb Williams is on the other side of the first down because they did not call forward progress like they sometimes do. Uh, not, not to get into the ref situation there, but yeah, almost had Oklahoma dude, on the ropes a couple years ago. They were been a massive, massive upset. They were emailing people like, "Go to the game, like get to the game. It's free. Just go in and support our Jayhawks." And and we still lost. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, we've we've done a pretty good job. Um, it makes me think. Man, Jalen, just sit out, dude. You know, sit out and and get healthier, get healthier. Because I would love to see Jason Bean in this game. I think overall his confidence is gaining week over week, and I'd love to see Jason play out this game. And yes, we still have a chance, even with Jason Bean. I I know I know the Oklahoma State game didn't go that well, but we have we always have a shot. I don't really think we're gonna win, but it's like if it gives us a chance to just let. Jalen Daniels sit a little bit longer, by all means do it. And then at that point, I'm kind of like, well, shoot, what does this mean for next year? Does this mean that he's going to, what if he like chooses not to go to the NFL because, you know, maybe he's looked at as injury prone and he needs to have a full year of no injuries before he really wants to try his chances at, uh, in the draft, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that, like, Okay, this could be this could mean we get him next year for sure. Whereas I think at the beginning of this season, we probably all expected him to ball out and then leave, um, and you know go make money, go make real money at least in the uh, in the NFL. It might be another year of Jalen, and if it is, it's like shoot, does he ball out or does he get hurt again? And then you just start to feel really bad for him as a player because it's like man, this kid is a tremendous talent. But he can't stay healthy, and makes you, it just breaks your heart. So, um, hoping he sits out, honestly, for at least the Oklahoma game. So here's here's where I stand with Jalen Daniels' injury. I am 29, and I am not in the shape of a college athlete like they are. I tweaked my back several weeks ago, and I am sitting here right now on camera, sitting in this chair, going, "Dang, my back hurts right now." Sitting here, so backs can be very fluky. Um, back injuries don't just go away overnight. They can linger. It doesn't take much, you know, for us now I can wake up, sleep in the wrong position. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm a little tight today. So I do have to, I, I do like give him the sympathy of that. He's probably going through some pain here and there. So my question in though is how much of it is pain management? How much of it is worry of further injuring it? You know, cause everybody talks about once you have one back surgery or need to have one back surgery, you can bet yourself you're going to have multiple down the road because once you get started under back surgery, it's unlikely that that's the last time that you go under the knife. Um, so I, that's where some of it is for me. I really think going back to the Texas game and I got some inside knowledge from uh, a connection of mine who was talking with a player and uh, said that they were so shocked and surprised during the Texas game that Jalen wasn't playing. Because even going through warmups as the team, Jalen was in uniform warming up with them. And then literally minutes later, hey, guys, uh, Jalen's sitting this one out. He's hurt. Jason's starting. And even guys, and this was a player on the offense, was like, I just saw him warm up with me five minutes ago. What's going on? I think whatever went on that day, whatever it was, tweak, pain, whatever the case may be, no one really knows the true answer except for inside the, the coaching staff. I think that threw KU off so much. One, they didn't know how to respond, of course, that that game. And I don't blame you. How do you change your game plan five minutes before kickoff? Um, so you don't you don't have him for Texas. Whatever the case may be, it was all right, we're gonna sit him down for a while, rest him. As soon as it was pretty much announced that he was not gonna be playing for UCF, okay, we roll with Jason Bean, get him some more practice and prep time. Now it's another week later. I think my thought process from the coaching staff was well, we can beat UCF without him. And we're good enough to beat Oklahoma State without him. So let's just sit him, get him off the sideline. Just, hey, go lay down in an isolation chamber. Don't let anybody touch you, move around you, whenever. Just lay still, relax, get to the bye week. So he has a whole extra week of rest and a whole extra week of preparation before the Oklahoma game. And if he's ready, we roll him out for Oklahoma. That being said, I think where I stand now is if he cannot play in the Oklahoma game, I don't need to see him back the rest of the season. Ooh. I would love to see him back because I still think he's the better of the two quarterbacks. And I think we can all agree with that. 
my thought process now shifts to what do we need to do to put Jason Bean in the best position to win? If he's coming into practice every single day with the question mark of, is Jalen going to be the starter today? Is Jalen on the field today? Like I feel for him going, having to have that mindset shift every single game to back up the starter to back up the spark starter. Yeah. If, if Jalen can't play, then let's just roll with Jason. We know what his limitations are. We can tweak the offense around him. We know our strength on this team is the run game, as we're going to talk some more about here in a second. So if, if he can't play for Oklahoma, then I say sit him for the rest of the year. That would potentially still leave him eligible for a medical redshirt to get two more years. And that's my take. I think I'm I'm almost to the point that if, if we find out he's not going to play at Oklahoma, I think as a fan, I'm ready to go, okay, it's just not his time this year. It, it sucks. It's unfortunate. But let's roll with Jason Bean, figure out how to tweak the offense around of it, and focus in on that. Because now we know every single day going into practice, the focus is Jason Bean under center. Yeah, it's his last it's- year, isn't it, Jason Bean? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I honestly, I agree. It would it, be one heck of a way to have a good send-off for Jason Bean, a, a worthy send-off. He's, he's um, you know, he's got – He's got a lot of arm. He, he can handle it. And on the flip side, how lucky are we sitting here with Jason deciding to come back? Because he was not going to come back. He was going to graduate <laughs> and move on. Decides to come back and said, Ethan Vasco transfers out. Are we sitting here five and two with anybody else under center that's currently no. on the roster or could have not transferred? I don't think we are. Jason Bean saved our season. Let me hear it, Chris. <laughs> All right. Hey, whatever you guys say. I mean, I don't know how I don't know how scared of you know UCF you guys would have been without with any other quarterback, but you know, I I am grateful for Jason being knowing that this is probably still a bowl eligible team, even if um you know we don't we don't get in for the rest of the year. So yeah. All right, so we're at the bye week. Let's uh think about expectations moving forward. We got a big, big matchup with Oklahoma next week, which of course we'll preview next week. What needs to happen during this bye week to continue the success we've had, whether it's with the run game, the impressive defense, Austin Booker and the pass rush, um, getting Jason more playing time or practice time. What all needs to go down during this bye week to continue this success so that we don't do what happened last year and kind of unravel going down to the end of the season? For me, it's kind of like, I I hate to relate it back to the Oklahoma State game specifically, but I think we regressed a little bit defensively. Um, You know, we talked about how in our preview, we want to go up by a couple scores and and keep our foot on the gas. Well, we completely fell asleep for multiple drives to start that game. So I think defensively, we need to wake up and stay up from the very beginning. Um, But also, I I specifically noted there were a couple times where we were inches away or just a a grab and hold away from uh, a pick six. I mean, it was it was tough to see Kobe Bryant have a clear shot at a pick six, but he dropped the ball. Uh, Same thing with Melo Dotson. I think he had one, too. Um, I want to see glue on the hands of our defense when they get in the way of those passing lanes and and you know, potentially bring it home for a pick six. I want to see a little bit more of that. Um, I was, I was, you know, happy to see the aggression turn up, but it was a little bit too little too late for me. I just think with any bye week, it's about getting healthy, you know, like, I mean, guys getting the, you played seven weeks of the season, you know, just, just, you know, I don't know how much you can really like outside of what you already do. I don't know how much you can really do at the college level. Like you have the guys you have the offensive line, you know, struggled a little last week, but for the most part, this run game has been the strength of this team, especially when Jalen hasn't been playing. Um, I just think it comes down to health. It, I am a little upset that it does come on an Oklahoma week where you are five and two and you may or may not have your quarterback because like, it'd be really nice to have an extra week to prepare for like Iowa state or someone that like, you know, is a little bit of a closer matchup, not to say, mm-hmm. not to say I'm already punting on the Oklahoma game, but you know, you know where I'm at. Like it would be nice to have two weeks to prepare for an evenly matched opponent, like a K state, like an Iowa state, instead of a team that's a, has a little bit more talent than you, but. Overall, it's just, you know, get healthy, maybe fine tune some things, coach up, but I don't think they should really change a ton from what they've been doing this year. Yeah, I think outside of hopefully getting Jalen healthy, right? Just the rest for that running back room is probably fantastic too. You know, 
this is the first game that we really saw high shot and and Neil not really be stopped, but they were slowed down. So giving them a week and a half of game rest per se, you know, helps keep those legs fresh for down the stretch. But sitting here at the halfway point, I do want to reflect a little bit statistically on where KU's sitting, because again, as frustrating as that loss was, KU's still five and two. They are one win away from bowl eligibility. They're two and two in the conference, which puts them technically in third place. Still with an outside shot of making it to the Big 12 championship, I think they for sure have to win out. Um, but <laughs> you win that game. Oklahoma game, we're right in it. Yeah, and of course that's a, that's a big task. Uh, but let's kind of look at some of the the things statistically. Obviously, we've talked about the run game has been solid. Um, I, JB and I mentioned it in the preview over the weekend. Going into the weekend. Devin Neal and Daniel Hyshaw combined were the leading rushing duo in the nation, not just the Big 12. Uh, Devin Neal currently is at 659 yards. And when I was pulling up the offensive stats, that places him. Let me pull that back up. Top uh, 15. He's at number 15 in the nation for rushing yards. Um, him and Hyshaw are both top 20 in the nation in touchdowns with both, both at six. Uh, so Neal's having an incredible season. Um, you know, he's on pace to get over a thousand yards. It's even possible if Highshaw has another couple games that we could have 2000 yard rushers, um, or at least 2000 yards combined between the two. Um, so I think they've been solid defensively. Austin Booker has been a menace. You know, he's number, he's tied for number one in the big 12 with five sacks and Jeremy Robinson right behind him at four and a half. And then whereas that puts him in the nation right now, Austin Booker is four sacks behind the leader. Um, so he's top 20 technically. If you want to look at it, it's like top top 12 if you go off of uh, total numbers. Um, defense has had some nice bright spots. Obviously, Kobe Bryant's gotten a couple picks and has forced a couple turnovers. You know, the linebackers have been pretty solid. Um, what to you guys has kind of been either the biggest surprise statistically for, for across the group at this point or who just really stands out to you the most with where KU's sitting? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I think it just starts with Neil. I mean, I, I like what Highshaw brings as a change of pace back, and I know he's having a strong season as well, but I just love what Neil gets the ball and just what he's able to do for the second straight year. Um, You know, like you said, top 15 in rushing yards. Really, it's just having a strong running game, especially in college football, just takes so much pressure off your quarterbacks and everyone else that, like, knowing that he's going to be a guy again. And I know he just slowed down a little bit last week, but, like, He's just something consistent you can rely on and having any form of consistency in this game is, is huge. Yeah. I love what you said there. It was, um, it was a pleasant surprise definitely to see that we don't always have to rely on having a tremendous quarterback with a really good arm. We've got, we've got the run game pretty solid down pat. Um, It's really cool to go into a game when you can see, the ESPN graphic across the screen that says this is the best duo in mm -hmm. college football. It's like, man, since when is KU the best at anything in college football? <laughs> so I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Yeah. Here I'll throw you guys out a couple more statistics here with KU as far as the big 12 is concerned uh, through the first four weeks of conference play. KU has scored the most points at 135 with Texas Tech behind them at 122. However, KU has given up the second most points at 128. So even though the offense has been right there and has kept them in every single game, of course, the defense, now they're facing stronger competition, has struggled. Uh, then as far as the season goes as a whole in the Big 12, KU has the most points scored for the full season at 248. But again, they also have given up the most points defensively now. So the defense is kind of sliding back to where we anticipated them being with, with stronger competition. Um, but still pretty impressive for the offense, considering we've had you know two different quarterbacks throughout the season. Um, I think the one question mark I really have on the offense outside of Jason Bean's decision making is <laughs> can we see a little bit more out of the, of the pass game? Um, I know we haven't needed it as much in some of these wins, but the wide receiver room doesn't really have much impressive statistics to throw out there. You know, Quentin Skinner's big, big play down the field kind of guy. You know, I thought by this point, Luke Grimm would be a little bit further along. Same with Lawrence Arnold and in the tight end. So I think for me, that's one thing I hope we can see a little bit more of down the stretch because you can't just ground and pound all the time. Then the defense is going to start loading the box and 
preventing that. And if we can't throw the ball down the field, then we're not going to be able to keep up with some of these offenses. Um, but outside of that, you know, again, it's been pretty solid. Again, the defensive line's been impressive. We've got double double digit sacks there across the team, you know, leading with Austin Booker and Jeremy Robinson. Um, who are a couple guys on this team up to this point that have surprised you the most? And then we'll go into guys that have disappointed. You know, I, I'm kind of surprised at really, I think Mason Fairchild. I, I think we don't use utilize him enough. So in a sense, he's almost like both. He's surprising, but also a little bit disappointing. And that's not his fault. Um, but he's got good hands and he's, he's been pretty reliable for us, uh, especially in some shorter yard situations. Having a tight end like Mason Fairchild is amazing for us. And if that works to Jason's Bean or Jason Bean's strengths better, if that works to his strength, then let's utilize him more. Yeah, I think Fairchild's going to be a practice squad legend in the NFL. Because oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't think he's going to get drafted, but I think he's going to show enough to stick around on a team. I love Fairchild, man. Like like you said there, JB, I wish they used him a little bit more. Um, I don't – I don't know how many like surprises there's really been overall. I think the guys that we expected to come in and make plays have for the most part, there's been a few disappointments, but we were expecting Neil, we were expecting Kobe uh, Booker to an extent, like, you know, the, a lot of the guys that you thought were going to be kind of carry the success of this team for the most part have, have rose into rose to that occasion. So no real surprises for me so far. I wish, you know, Maybe we saw a little bit more consistency out of the receivers, but there's really no one. There's just three guys that they really like that it's hard to look at their each individual numbers and really give them too much flack for that. Yeah. I think my surprise pick, and again, maybe not so much of a surprise. We just didn't know what his ceiling was going to be, and that's Austin Booker. Wasn't the biggest transfer name at the time because he wasn't really getting any playing time up in Minnesota, but he's clearly had an impressive impact. And I think it's been a bigger impact than what Lonnie Phelps had last year. Um, so I think maybe a little bit of surprise there just because he is on a, he's on a really solid pace right now where he could, you know, if he kicks it into gear here more, he could finish with double digit sacks. Um, I think he's just the surprise one because we weren't quite sure what we were going to get out of him. I think everyone heading into the year was expecting it to be, you know, Jeremy Robinson, Hayden Hatcher, being those two guys that are upperclassmen. Um, but he's been solid. Um, I think just the defense as a whole, I've been mostly impressed with guys that hadn't got a lot of playing time. I think Melo Dotson's starting to continue to develop to be a, a solid man defender. We already know what Kobe Bryant's been. I don't think that's been surprising at all. He's one of the least thrown against corners in the league. Um, I think the – the the negative surprise, I guess, for the slight letdowns, I think uh, I go back to the offense. I'm a little disappointed. I'm not necessarily saying this is player performance, but disappointed in the lack of use of our tight ends. Like Jared Casey has been, he's been, a, he's a tremendous blocker. Don't get me wrong. He's used in a lot of run plays um, blocking because he's a great one-on-one -on -one blocker. Um, but I think we haven't really tried to dive into the creativity of the tight ends. We've got a solid trio there. You know, two of the three of them are probably capable of being first, second team, all Big 12. And I think Trevor Cardell's right there too, talent wise. Um, but I think that's where I've been a little disappointed, just not seeing enough of that. However, though, some of that's been the trade off of a super effective run game, like you said. And if we're running the ball 150 to 200 yards a game, you don't necessarily need to utilize the tight ends there. Um, but how about you guys? Anybody that's disappointed you player performance wise this year? Yeah, not really. Like, again, it's for the most like I, I will after I just said receivers, I'm not going to be too hard on because the running game. Grim's the only one that maybe I was expecting like a little bit more in the stat sheet just because I think that dude's a dog and I think he's reliable. But I know again, yeah. run game and he's been battling some injuries a little bit too. So, again, he's the only one that if you looked at the stat sheet and showed me this without knowing anything I'd be surprised about. But I think he's got plenty of excuses to where, like, there's really no one that's standing out to me. Oddly enough, sure. he leads the receivers and tight ends in the touchdown department. Yeah, exactly. He grabs touchdowns. I, but, like, um, didn't he have two in that – what game was that that he caught two there? In the back? Was it one of the home games? Like, Yeah, I think it was the UC – it might have been the UC. No. No, because they ran the ball. I don't, I don't it, remember. Uh, They're all blurring together. But like, Missouri I know State game? I think it was the Missouri State <laughs> Probably, game. Probably. But um, it's like you just look at the end of the day, like 
the yardage isn't always there, but again, that's not always his fault because of how good Neil and High Shot have been. Agreed. All right, so that's halfway point. Now we've got another chunk of games left down the year, of course. Like we said, Oklahoma coming up big time. Top 10 matchup there at home. Oklahoma has quickly put themselves as one of the top teams in the country with the impressive win they had over Texas. Uh, really frustrated that Texas team and was quite impressive in, in that matchup there. And even though they're sitting at number six, they've got a clean path to the college football playoff. Uh, so definitely the biggest test. You know, up to this point, even with that loss, is it is it Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas as far as in order of most impressive teams in the Big Twelve? You know, what's I know K is not necessarily third in the in the standings, but where do you guys see the Big Twelve currently as a group? I think overall, yes. I think it would be those three in that order. Um, especially if we had Jalen Daniels the entire way. We've already talked at length of that, so um, you know, maybe for rest of season outlook, I think we've kind of slid down to four or five at best. I think there's a good argument to have uh, K-State ahead of us. There's an argument to have West Virginia ahead of us, which I don't think we expected at the beginning of the season. Um, but overall, I think we can absolutely end up at third if we, um, you know, if we lose to Oklahoma and then win out. I know it'd be crazy, but hey, lose to Oklahoma and then win out because all those games are winnable. Um, We'd be very, very happy with that and with that ending to the season. Yeah, it's like they're in a weird spot. Jalen Daniels, I think they're clearly third without Jalen Daniels. Iowa State is another team you could throw in there that has been um, a little bit of a surprise, at least for me. Yeah. Um, so, like again, it just comes down to uh, down to Jalen Daniels' health or what they want to do with that. It kind of determines the outlook or expectations for this team moving forward. So without Daniels, let's assume he's not playing, and let's assume KU drops to Oklahoma. They've got Iowa State, Texas Tech, K-State, and Cincinnati to close out the season. How do we feel about KU running the table after that and finishing 9-3? and three? I think we lose to K-State and if with, with Jason Bean. Um, but I think we – I don't know. It's tough. Because I don't know, man. K- Will Howard hasn't been that great this year. They're looking at going with a freshman now. <laughs> and that's a had game. Yeah, they, he did have five touchdowns in their last game, which is impressive for a freshman to do. I had to do it like a triple take on that box score. But I hate bringing up history, but, like, man, we got excited two years ago when we had K-State at home, and we got blown the heck back. Like, um, I just I, – I think – I think we have a shot, yeah, but it's it's starting to trend toward like will history repeat itself and and we just lose again to K State. I I, I really would have loved to have Jalen. I mean, we still can have Jalen Daniels for that game. Um, I I love my guy Jason Bean. I'm trying to stay positive with him, but that's the one that scares me. I think Texas Tech is a win for us. I I think Iowa State. I think that's and it's been at year. Iowa State this year. It's at yes. Iowa State. It's always tough up there. It's trending toward being a loss for me. At the beginning of the season, I would have said it's a it's a lock for us to win. That one's starting to trend toward being a loss. But yes, I think we can beat Cincinnati. I think we can beat Texas Tech, and I I think we're going to end up with seven wins uh, if Jason is our guy the rest of the way. Yeah, I What's... don't know what. Oops, sorry. No, you're trying. You're I, was like, I didn't know what games we're going to win. I don't know what games we're going to lose. But if Jason means the rest, I expect two and two after the OU game. Okay. <laughs> two two. The best still, it still has its own ball. And so, what would be in your guys' mind, either worst case scenario or what would what would have to happen down the stretch for this season to be considered a disappointment from where we started to where we are currently? Hmm. I would say, I would say, we can lose we can lose to Oklahoma and still be very happy about where the season is at but if if in the remaining four games if if we lose three of them i think that's where it's a disappointment i don't care if that uh, with the one the one asterisk the one asterisk i feel like you already know what i'm about to say if we beat k state it is a victory for kansas i don't care what the record is if we beat K State, it's going to be a victory of a season, and I am so happy. And I will tweet it out, and I will, I will be just, I will be a menace on KU Twitter when we win that game. K State would be huge. Yeah, 
that'd be a giant game for me. It's like win, win one more game at least to go bowling. But like, if you just finish at six and seven, like I will still be happy. They'll be bowling for back to back years, but I will sit there thinking they did it again. Like they got us excited. We were ranked, you know, we were had a chance to you know, we're five and two. And then we went six and seven, barely got a bowl and it just kind of fell apart at the end. So even though like one win is all I really want to like, to just to be like content, I think at the end of the day, when I look back on it, I'd be disappointed. So give me, give me two wins, get me to seven, seven and five, a continued growth, even with the, you know, struggles with quarterback and whatnot. And uh, I think, I think that's, it would be a successful season for me. It's honestly weird being on this other side of expectations. And now we're like, all right, we're five and two. We should win. We should be going bowling. You know, three weeks ago, we could sit here and go, Man, KU should be in the Big 12 championship. What are you talking about? They're playing one of the, they're one of the best teams in the Big 12. And all it takes is two weeks of the wrong things happening at the end of the year. I'm just my hope is KU becomes bowl eligible before basketball season officially starts. And that is coming like that. up in KU basketball, of course, has a, a scrimmage in less than two weeks against Illinois. So for me, that's start of basketball season. So KU's got to win one more the next two weeks before basketball season. I think that would be impressive. If you can lock up bowl eligibility each year before basketball starts, one, you're going to keep the fan base excited and tuned in because when basketball season starts, it's Allen Fieldhouse 24-7. So if football can can keep you interested long enough to transition you into basketball season, I think that that's a success every year. Um, so that that's what I'm looking forward to. Take on K-State at home you know, show up big, be competitive, come out and find a way to pull that game out, win down the stretch like we should go eight and four, nine and three, and hopefully Jalen's healthy. But next week we will re- uh, preview the big time Oklahoma matchup and talk about Katie's chances there. And hopefully by then we'll have some, some, some information about Jalen, whether he's playing or not. Um, but we'll break down that matchup moving forward. Uh, just again, a reminder, you can find Chris down below there. He is also co-host of the aftermath podcast go check out all their chiefs episodes they have up on our youtube page right now you've got chiefs yes would love to get some more chief support i've been a little surprised at the lack of attention there and the chiefs are also one the most dominant team in the nfl right now so why not go listen to their content Um, and you'll occasionally find me on there with them as well but yeah they've got chiefs uh broncos recap up currently and then they'll have chiefs versus chargers preview not too long after you guys watch this one Um, and then, uh, I know the three of us have talked about doing some, some trade deadline talk, you know, obviously by the time you've watched this, you know, that they have brought in McCall Hardman again. Um, I know you guys will have a little bit of, uh, your response to that in that next episode. Um, but we'll kind of talk a little bit more about what other moves they could make or moves we hope they make. Um, and then, yeah, basketball season's right around the corner. Uh, we'll have an episode coming on that. Uh, Chris and I might start talking some Royals off season here soon. Um, just trying to lock in a few potential outside guests to make that more exciting than just hearing us talk about what we would do, but get some guys that are more plugged in. So still a lot of stuff coming. This is about my, almost my favorite time of year for sports, yeah. because you got the crossover starting to happen between the wrap up of baseball season, the, you know, the peak of football season and then basketball seasons coming up. And of course, Spencer and I are going to start doing some NBA talk here. So, Make sure you're following us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at KCSA Pod. Um, follow us on all those so you're up to date on any new releases of episodes. Make sure you're subscribing on Spotify and on YouTube right here where you can watch us. Um, that way you are getting notified when new episodes drop. And then, Chris, where can they find all information about the aftermath? Yeah, you can follow us at the at aftermath underscore KC. Just keep up. Um, you know, the activity on there it comes and goes, but, uh, you know, if you want to follow me on 10 at 10 penny 88 or my co-host at, uh, CGZ, CJ Jones, he always, uh, is putting out film and, and different takes on. So always good. Always good to talk chiefs. Yep. And CJ and I might have some, uh, fantasy football stuff coming here soon. We got a couple, couple things, some thoughts going on to get there, but, guys that's going to wrap us up for this one again thank you for joining us this has been the ku football mid-season reflections and hopefully coming out of this bye week it's full steam ahead and we can wrap up bowl eligibility and see how the future what the future has in store for us so thanks again for joining us on this one guys and we will holler at you later rock chalk 
Rock Chalk.